By early 1945, the outcome of the Second World War was obvious to anyone. Italy had been knocked out, Germany was retreating on all fronts, and the Americans were within striking distance of the Japanese mainland. The question the Allies faced was how to end the war as quickly and with as few casualties as possible. This thinking would lead to one of the most controversial Allied actions of the war, the fire bombing of Tokyo, codenamed Operation Meeting House. In this video, we'll explore what Operation Meeting House was and ask whether it was the right call. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this one. With the conquest of Guam and the Marianas in early 1945, American bombers could now reliably strike Japan itself. Allied leadership began to consider how they might undertake an invasion of Japan, once Germany had been defeated in Europe. Certainly, Japan would have to be weakened first. Its industrial capacity had to be crippled, and its population demoralized to pave the way for a full-scale invasion. This was the issue faced by Major General Curtis LeMay, commander of the 21st Bomber Command in the Pacific. LeMay addressed this problem the same way the Allies had solved the issue in Europe, with the most American solution of all – bombs. LeMay and the US military leadership knew that a strategic bombing campaign on Japanese cities would cripple their industry and demoralize the population, much as it had done in Germany. These bombing campaigns would inevitably target civilians, but this didn't phase LeMay or any of the US leadership. After all, the entire conflict had seen atrocity upon atrocity inflicted on non-combatants. And ultimately, the US believed that the civilian costs were worth the potential saving of military lives. While almost every city was considered, Tokyo was the natural priority it being the capital and one of the most populous and industrialized cities in Japan. In early 1945, plans were drawn up for a massive air raid that would devastate Tokyo's population and cripple Japan's war effort. Operation Meeting House had been born. LeMay specifically planned for an incendiary bombing. About 90% of the structures in Tokyo were made of wood and other flammable materials. LeMay compared it to someone setting fire to a toy village when he was a kid. Quote, so he set fire to the first house, and brother, they all went. Once the fire started, it would ravage the entire city. The US Strategic Bombing Survey SBS, analyzed Tokyo to determine that an area of northeastern Tokyo would be the most effective place to focus a bombing campaign. However, this was not an industrial center. The SBS estimated that almost 85% of the designated area was purely residential. LeMay recalled the grim calculations he made in his autobiography. Quote, no matter how you slice it, you're going to kill an awful lot of civilians. Thousands and thousands. But if you don't destroy the Japanese industry, you're going to have to invade Japan. And how many Americans will be killed in an invasion of Japan? 500,000 seems to be the lowest estimate, some say a million. Do you want to kill Japanese or would you rather have Americans killed? On March 8, 1945, LeMay gave the order to prepare for a bombing run the following night. Around 300 B-29 flying fortresses were designated for the operation. LeMay wanted as many bombs on the planes as possible, so he ordered all guns and ammunition stripped from the bombers. Even the gunners were taken off the crew to make room for more bombs. The bombers were outfitted with a mix of large 100-pound M47 incendiary bombs and smaller 6-pound M69 napalm bombs, along with an assortment of more conventional munitions. The bombers were assigned into groups that would each fly at a different altitude, so they could avoid radar detection and coordinate their attacks more effectively. On the evening of March 9th, the operation began. Hundreds of bombers launched from US-controlled airfields, and it would take almost three hours for every plane to get in the air. LeMay was prohibited from taking part. The US couldn't risk his capture since he knew of the still-secret atomic bomb so command was passed to Brigadier General Thomas Power. It took several more hours to reach Tokyo. 
the unusually low altitude made it hard for the Japanese's limited radar capabilities to detect them. However, scout boats spotted the bombers before they reached the city. But when the boats tried to radio their superiors, their warnings did not reach the city. Several Japanese recon units reported low-flying aircraft. But these reports were dismissed as simple reconnaissance planes that weren't worth the effort to shoot down. Or as false reports since the Japanese did not believe planes would be flying that low. All this meant that the massive bombing fleet reached Tokyo unharmed and undetected. At 8 minutes past midnight on the 10th of March, the first bomb fell. The first wave of bombers had specific instructions to split off and fly at right angles to one another over the target area, using their firebomb to mark a giant X shape on the ground. The succeeding waves used the fires to guide their own bombs and target areas not already lit up by the flames. It took more than 5 minutes for the Japanese command to realize they were under attack. Fighters were launched but amidst the darkness, chaos and unusual altitudes of the bombers, they were completely ineffective. Not a single B-29 was shot down by a fighter during the entire raid. The Japanese ground defense proved marginally more successful. Anti-air guns were stationed around the city. But again, the unexpectedly low altitude meant that most of the AA fire missed. Additionally, many of the guns were inside the city and had to be abandoned as the fire spread. Nevertheless, the Japanese shot down 14 B-29s over the course of the raid and damaged several more. However, this was only a small fraction of the massive bombing fleet. For most bomber crews, the night must have been surreal. Each wave poured more bombs onto the inferno consuming the city. Even in their bombers, the airmen could feel the heat from below and as the heat rose, the bombers themselves were pushed higher into the air. For the people of Tokyo, the night was beyond a nightmare. There's no need to explain what would happen to a person, to a family, inside of a wooden building when an incendiary bomb crashed into their roof. The fires would quickly spread from house to house, catching on the flammable materials that the Japanese relied upon to build their homes. The chaos and confusion as civilians were awoken in the middle of the night to anti-aircraft fire, explosions, and fires tearing through the streets would have been immense. Tokyo had several thousand firefighters on hand, but little modern firefighting equipment. Even then, conventional firefighting techniques aren't effective against napalm. The firefighters soon gave up trying to fight the fire and focused on evacuating as many people as they could. Some people tried to survive in bunkers or crudely dug foxholes, but the fires destroyed them too. If the flames didn't get them, the sheer heat would, or they would suffocate as the fire consumed the oxygen and unleashed fatal amounts of carbon monoxide. Staying still was a death sentence, no matter where they tried to hide. One eyewitness described rivers of fire cutting through the city. Everywhere the wind kicked up the flames into fiery vortexes that quickly spread to nearby buildings. Evacuation was the only hope for survival, but even that was dangerous. As over a million residents scrambled to escape in the middle of the night with smoke clouding the air and the fire tearing through and cutting off escape routes, escape was easier said than done. Many ran, only to find themselves trapped in a dead end. Some people were crushed to death as stampedes fought to get through the handful of safe escape routes. All the while, bombs continued to fall, sometimes landing in the middle of crowds of fleeing civilians. One survivor described the experience. Koji Kikushima was just 13 years old, living with the other six members of his family in the Kototoibashi suburb when the attack took place. His house avoided a direct hit, but the fire quickly began consuming his neighborhood. His family frantically gathered what few possessions they could and tried to flee across the Sumida River that winds through Tokyo. With smoke choking the air and fire cutting off so many routes, the only path was across the Kototoi Bridge. Around them, the wind blew burning air into their face, setting their clothes and belongings alight. Koji recalled his younger sister screaming for her mother and telling her that she couldn't breathe.
they made it to the bridge, but so had thousands of other people who had no other way to escape. Koji's family clawed through the crowd. They only got more frantic as the flames surged closer. Koji and his younger sister got separated from their family in the crowd, and when the fire finally reached the bridge, they took their chances and leapt into the river below. Koji and his sister crawled out of the river hours later, when the fires had finally died down. The bridge had survived, but the charred remains of hundreds of people showed that not everyone had been that lucky. Koji and his sister searched fruitlessly for their parents and their siblings, but they never saw them again. All in all, the raid itself lasted for 2 hours and 40 minutes. The flames raged on for hours, but by mid-morning, they had run out of new things to burn and died out. The Sumida River acted as a natural firebreak, which probably saved the rest of the city from the inferno. Still, about a quarter of the city had been destroyed. Practically no one was recovered alive from the ashes, and they could only begin to guess how many people had been killed. In its report, the SBS estimated that 88,000 people had been killed and 40,000 injured. They concluded that, quote, probably more persons lost their lives by fire at Tokyo in a six hour period than at any time in the history of man. And the largest number of victims were the most vulnerable, women, children, and the elderly. Other estimates were higher. The Tokyo Fire Department estimated that 97,000 people were killed, with the Tokyo Police Department claiming 124,000. Most historians accept a number around 100,000, although some have pushed it higher based on population density calculations. For the survivors, there would be little closure. It was impossible to identify so many of the bodies and people were left to wonder whether their family or friends had actually escaped and got lost in the waves of refugees or whether they lay somewhere in the smoldering ruins. For the Americans, the raid was a resounding success. 15 square miles of Tokyo had been destroyed, at the cost of just 14 B-29s downed and 42 damaged, with 96 airmen dead or missing. The returning airmen were pleased with their work, and the US commanders were satisfied with the results. LeMay himself believed the mission was a success, although he said little about his feelings on the human casualties. There is no record of any significant questioning of the attack, or any scruples over the civilian death count at the time. Meeting House was a success, but it was only the start of a months-long bombing campaign against Japan. Bombing raids would continue, including incendiary raids, on all but five major Japanese cities for the rest of the war. But none would be as devastating as that one night. Until, of course, the atomic bomb fell on Hiroshima on 6 of August that year. The firebombing of Tokyo is one of the most complicated events of the Second World War. World War II is usually portrayed as a morally simple war, the heroic allies against the evil Axis. The unspeakable horrors of the Holocaust or Japan's Unit 731 certainly align with this. However, there is a growing recognition that the Allies committed many actions that would be roundly condemned as evil in any other context. Mass bombing was a staple of World War II strategy for both sides. It's telling that no one at the Nuremberg or Tokyo post-war trials was brought up on charges relating to air raids. After all, the Allies dropped far more bombs on the Axis than the other way around. Some argue that Allied war crimes are overlooked. They insist that the undeniable crimes of the Axis should not mean the Allies get a free pass. The firebombing of Tokyo, like the bombing of Dresden or the dropping of the atomic bombs, took tens of thousands of civilian lives. By some estimates, more people died in one night from the bombing of Tokyo than there were American citizens killed in the entire Second World War. Some insist that the grim reality is that it's only a war crime if you're the loser. Evil the Axis may have been, but do two wrongs make a right? Others argue that the bombing was necessary. It's easy to look back and judge from peacetime, 
but the world had been gripped by unparalleled conflict for years and was facing the prospect of even more to come. An invasion of Japan would have taken months and cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lives from civilians and servicemen alike. As grim as the death tolls from Tokyo, Hiroshima or Nagasaki were, were they lower than the alternative? People have debated the answer for decades and will still do so for years to come. Let us know what you think in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more thought-provoking insights into history like this one.